Um, yeah, I suppose, hello um, everyone. My name is Amanda O'Donnell. I'm the Traveller Peer Support Worker at the TVG Drug and Alcohol Project. Um, as many of you know, the TVG is a community development project based in Cork City. It was founded in the 90s by a group of travel women, including Breed O'Donoghue, our current advocacy manager. Um, and Lauren, myself, Drug and Alcohol Project supports families and people struggling with drug and alcohol problems. Um, I welcome you to the event this morning, opening the door more services working with travellers in 2022. Uh, this event highlights how services can strengthen culturally strong work and build more relationship with traveller projects and with my community. This will improve my community's experience of healthcare services. We have a busy morning ahead of us. Uh, Breda Dunhu will launch research by Gabriella Bashabene, University College Cork. Um, we're playing an audio piece made by my community and we're playing an interview recorded. We did last Wednesday night and then Dr. Sharon Lambert will host a panel discussion for the final hour. Um, so just a small few of housekeeping tips for this morning. Um, please keep your mics off. Um, as this is a webinar, attendees' cameras are off. This event is being broadcasted live on the TVG Facebook page. Um, we will welcome comments and questions in the chat. Um, Mella McGee from Cork City Partnership is on standby to take notes of your comments and questions. We welcome you to use the chat for questions. I wish you a very good morning. I welcome people to get in touch with TVG after this event. I am passing you over to Anne Jordan, project worker at the TVG Traveller Drug and Alcohol Project, and will introduce the Family Support Project and how this research started. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amanda. Um, and it's fantastic to see such a widespread of people at the event this morning. Um, there's people from prisons, education, um, Manny from HSC, from addiction, um, early intervention, childcare, and you're all really welcome. It's many people from traveller projects, and um, we're looking forward to an interesting morning. So <laughs> I am a little bit nervous, and I am just going to share the piece that I'm going to do. So from the beginning. Okay. So here is our fabulous TVG building. And I'm just going to um, say that this was actually done alongside the Cork Community Art Link. It's um, looking beautiful at the moment. So um, I'm doing a presentation on the Family Support Project that we um, started back in 2019 and uh, was or has been called Family Support Project pretty much all along up until uh, the last month, really, when it's um, being changed into Building Bridges, which is lovely to um, to see. Okay, so this family support project has been developed by the myself um, and Jordan, community drug and alcohol worker with the Traveller Support Project on Drugs and Alcohol at the TVG, and um, Mella McGee, who is uh, working on the community outreach on drugs and alcohol awareness program at the Cork City Partnership. So how did this start? Um, started back in 2019. <coughs> There was a funding uh, opportunity through HSC, Cork and Kerry, Alcohol Harm and Family Project Grant. Um, not something that I was running to <laughs> apply for, but uh, encouraged and uh, glad that we did. And I suppose um, because it was based around families, because there were, and yeah, th that there was few traveller families really accessing the local addiction um, services. Um, I could see how stretched colleagues were in different reasons. Um, we we went for the proposal, um, but knowing that you know as part time worker on a small project that we needed some support, so I approached Mela, and Mela was really keen to get involved uh, with her own experience working with families and working with minority ethnic groups. So um, we put a proposal together, and it was really uh, coming from information that would have. Going, so like stemming back to 2006, which was like the first, I suppose, national piece on um, travelers using um, addiction services. And barriers identified then, which are still really relevant now, but barriers identified then um, into travelers using services 
were around the lack of in awareness in the community. One second, just to minimize this. Lack of awareness in the community um, of the existence and the nature of drug services, a lack of um, education amongst the community around addiction <clears throat> and substance misuse, the stigma and embarrassment of people coming forward looking for support, the lack of cultural competence among services, and the racism and discrimination and stereotyping that travelers are experiencing. Um, and then the, the more recent piece then was from 2017, which was um, indicating how many travelers were using family support services and addiction services around the country, and there was 12 travelers. So that was all um, being used then to inform why we focused on families and I suppose our own local knowledge around travelers using the services. Um, and what services were saying to us too. So yeah, we focus on capacity. Capacity um, because there was, we were, so it's building capacity amongst the non-traveler projects and that was to support the traveler community workers and ourselves in the drug and alcohol project. Um, that many traveler families are affected by addiction but are not using the services. So what I have noted here is that the traveler community health workers, the TCHWs that they work part-time, extremely stretched and covering a wide range of issues, accommodation, education, health, working with men, women and youth. And you know, being in a small project myself um, and with a colleague, um, we wanted to, and I suppose, yeah, we were trying to support non-traveler projects to really reach out to the community and that would hopefully build capacity amongst other projects to support the community and, and then I suppose build capacity with us too, you know, that we'd have um, that bit of space to, to focus on, on other things maybe at some level. But and the fact that there was no known travellers working in the general addiction service either. So the there was a, there's a lack of, I suppose, traveller knowledge as such in the services. Okay, so this is the idea, and it was to provide a wraparound training that wasn't run of the mill. So we didn't want to just provide a training and then people would shelve that or people would walk away from that and go, that's great now, we can get chapters into our project. We tried to really come up with something that would take time, that was something that we could reflect on, that would um, make connection. And the application was spread it across Cork and Kerry um, with sign off by the manager. That was important to us so that the project worker would really feel that they had the backing of the organization and that there would be some kind of like, I suppose, acknowledgement that this was something that was um, going to be included in work going forward, you know. So we made sure that we had strong family support training, which the five step method has loads of research saying how people from lots of different communities get lots of really, really good support from it. And um, we that was our main piece of family support training, but we wanted to, of course, uh, um, include the traveler um, cultural piece and ensure cultural competency. So we developed, or so we, so we put alongside the cultural awareness training and the trauma informed piece, of course, which I suppose really um, was speaking to the impact of discrimination that travelers have been experiencing for many years and then how they were presenting at services. So alongside that then as well, we wanted the reflective practice piece a number of months after the training um, and that hopefully would embed the competencies developed amongst the trainees. So that would increase the capacity, increase cultural competence and increase hopefully in time traveler families using the family support services. And we made sure then that we had research tracking all of this experience to show what a great project <laughs> it was. <laughs> um, but um, it went online, we had COVID of course. And yeah, so we, we had to put all the training online and that, that was a, a, a complication, but we managed to move forward. And over time we could see ourselves, we had two coordinators, uh, Mela and myself, we the five trainers between the five step training, Chris and Mick. Uh, we had Breda Donahue and Eileen Burke doing the travel coach awareness training. Um, Sharon, Dr. Sharon Lambert did the trauma informed piece and we had the researcher. Um, we had 16 trainees um, signed in from eight non-traveler organizations across Cork and Kerry. Um, and this was taking over nine months. So if you can see from the 
little bubbles that I've created, that the research question was happening at the beginning, then there was the spread of trainings, and actually, um, you can see under the five step, there's the accreditation process, which has actually been ongoing for the five step since that training. And then we had the research at the end of the three training, um, a reflective practice piece, and then the research at the end of the of the of the package, I suppose. And and again, that would show how uh, useful this type of um, more culturally competent training could be. But we faced a challenge and the sources of information, we knew that there was challenges coming in because the research was telling us that um, there was some a disconnect. Um, and we knew ourselves, myself and Mel, the coordinators, we were listening to what people were saying and we kind of knew from um, maybe, yeah, just the experience of it that there, the challenge around disconnection was happening. So again, going back to the online experience, disconnect you know people weren't meeting in the way that you kind of would normally with this type of training you know that there maybe the discussions between um between trainees being say in a traveler project because we probably would have done the training in the tpg for example or in another regional project to kind of have people in that environment um and we didn't have travelers on the training because we were trying to build capacity in the non-traveler projects. There wasn't the traveler voice in the training then when it was all online, we were missing that element, even though we had the cultural awareness piece, um, but we needed to do something more, you know? And um, so when we challenge, we get creative. So I suppose what you can see here is that we had to create more bubbles. We had to create more opportunities for people to connect um, and to, I suppose it was it was it was just it was a project that is a really around relationship and it wasn't something that we really kind of put our mind to at the beginning but of course as we went through it was more and more around relationship and it was becoming a, a central theme of the working together so um when these trainings were happening as you can see with the green bubbles the green ones are the ones that we had to kind of create as such but we were we hosted the supervision that was going on with the five step and that was supervision in relation to the accreditation process for the trainees. We, um, we knew the reflective practice piece was coming up, but people weren't really connecting. The trainees were struggling to kind of really get a, maybe make a connection between doing the traveler awareness piece and doing the five step piece. So we invited our traveler colleagues into the reflective practice session. But to do that, the traveler colleagues wanted more information around family support, especially to families and experience an addiction. So we did more information sessions with them. We had the reflective practice session and that was great. But again, that was online and was um, we, we did our best and it was a really interesting session. People wanted to meet and I suppose, um, and people wanted more connection. So we actually hosted a little WhatsApp group again, more with the five step people, but because of TVG hosting that, it made it kind of constantly had a background theme of travelers engaging. And we met up with the trainees and the regional community health workers um, in October, which was um, really, really important. And we basically did like a speed dating event. So we had the regional workers linked in with the trainees that were from their area and people got to put faces to each other. Um, and I suppose the final bubble then has been around this building bridges piece, which I can see now maybe that this project has been like a pre-development stage almost. And now in the building bridges, it's coming to more, um, I suppose more of the embedding in organizations. So if you look at the text just underneath, two years later, 16 trainees would have signed up. We have six fully accredited with the five step and there's three at the assessment stage. Um, we've connected with the five traveler projects in the area, in the region. Now going forward, two traveler health workers from the TVG are actually going to do the five step training that's starting in February, um, which would be really interesting to see how their experience is going forward. And we have, I worked with four affected family members um, having started the, I suppose having done the five step through the project here in TVG. So it's showing some, um, um, I suppose, reach out to the traveler community, but it's um, it's still very much um, in the relationship phase of the, you know, where the, those project workers from the non-traveler projects um, really kind of needing more support from the likes of, from TVG and from, um, and, and more awareness around making the connection there with the community. 
So building bridges, and we have four trainees that are from the original group from the non from non travel projects are moving the project then now into this next phase alongside Amanda, the TPG peer worker and Mela, and that's where we are at now. So I hope that was. So I'm going to uh, hand you over to Brida O'Donoghue, and I suppose my intro there to the project was going into the was coming into where the research was very much part of all the um, training that was happening. So Brida is going to launch the research this morning, and she's going to introduce um, the audio piece that was worked on over the last few weeks. Rita. Thanks, Anne. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, everybody, and um, you're very welcome here today. I suppose just before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the passing of Ronnie Fay this morning from um, who worked tirelessly um, campaigning for travellers um, for the last 30 or so years. You know, I was very lucky. Um, to have met Ronnie a number of times, and um, particularly um, in the beginning of my own campaign, I suppose, over 20 years ago. So I, I, I'd just like to acknowledge um, um, the sad news this morning. And um, so, yeah, so I suppose on behalf of the Traveller Visibility Group, I would like to, um, to, to welcome uh, the publication of this research. And the research highlights the need for um, ongoing cultural, culturally competent work including um, anti-bias training as well, um, and, and, and welcome that right across the community healthcare sector. Um, I suppose the research uh, was written by uh, Gabriella Fetibeni, um, a postgraduate in the Department of Applied Psychology um, with UCC. The research looks at the experience of a group of, um, of a group of healthcare project workers engaged in a project to upskill themselves in culturally competent delivery of family support intervention, the five-step method, and, um, and to assist, uh, I suppose, those impacted by, um, by the, another's, another family member's uh, substance misuse. So I suppose the Family Support Combined Training Project was funded by Cork and Kerry Alcohol Harm and Families Grant and um, jointly delivered by Cork Traveller Visibility Group and the Drug and Alcohol Support Project alongside Cork City's City Partnerships Community Outreach. And the, uh, sorry, the uh, Drug and Alcohol Awareness Project in, in Cork City Partnership. I would like to express thanks to the Department of Public Health for funding and uh, the combined training package that facilitated the upskilling of 16 healthcare project workers across Cork and Kerry. The contribution of, of Cork Local Dr Drugs and Alcohol Task Force provided further funding to support additional costs at the, as the project developed um, is also greatly appreciated. Thanks to the five-step method trainers, to Chris Rankin, and a trainer and assessor for his availability, his interest and his support during the training and accreditation process. To Mick Mason for his support in delivery of both training and a subsequent reflective workshop with project participants. Thanks to Bridget Horgan, um, who coordinated the Traveller Cultural Awareness Training Initiative, and to my colleagues in TVG who delivered the trailer, the Traveller Cultural Awareness Training. Thanks to TVG and thanks to the Cork City Part Partnership Projects, who also coordinated the delivery of the training project and research. And to the 16 healthcare project workers who gave generously of their time in participating in the training, sharing their experiences in the research process, and through their ongoing engagement with Traveller Projects and the TBG staff in the, in the relationship aspects of this project. Thanks to all the staff of TBG and the Traveller Projects, uh, workers across Cork and Kerry, who made themselves readily available to participate in, in relationship building sessions with the healthcare project workers. Finally, um, a special thanks to the lovely Sharon Lambert, the Department of Applied Social Studies, uh, or sorry, Applied Psychology, University College Cork, for supervising this research and for facilitating a workshop on trauma-informed practice in relation to working with travellers, and also for her guidance uh, to the joint coordinators. 
Last but not least, thanks to the researcher Gabriella Fettibeni for her willingness, interest, and I suppose dedication in conducting this research over a longer than, ex than expected time frame from 2020 to early 22. I suppose during this time, the pandemic presented Irish society and marginalized communities like the travel community uh, in particular with serious challenges and, um, and have exasperated pre-existing health inequalities. I suppose it's my wish that the findings of this research be taken on board in the community healthcare sector as a means to address the stark health inequalities experienced by the tribal community, including poor mental health and greater levels of problematic substance misuse, regular anti-bias training and other measures to ensure cultural competency needs to be factored in across the community healthcare services. Healthcare staff need to be resourced and supported to deliver culturally competent services and have flexibility to prioritize community. Resourcing relational, relational work and building this trust is an essential prerequisite when supporting travelers to access and benefit from healthcare services and supports. It is noteworthy that this research highlights the value of relational work between community healthcare projects and the travel community. The responsibility for building trust with the travel community via relational work in order to support services access lies with healthcare providers. The Traveller Visibility Group welcomes the opportunity to provide services with networking and liaison support where this is required. I suppose in closing, I'm delighted to see the project workers who partook in this project and research are continuing their efforts to support traveller access to drug and alcohol service supports. The workers have established a network titled Building Bridges which will continue the project's work alongside the TVG's Drug and Alcohol Support Project and the CCP's Community Outreach Drug and Alcohol Awareness Project. There is a lot to be done in supporting travellers across the healthcare services. However, by working in cooperation to implement recommendations, hear the concerns and identify and overcome barriers, progress is possible. As the Irish proverb says, Goranen Bert Boher, two people shorten the road. So thanks very much, guys, and you're all very welcome. And we consider the report launched this morning. So I'm going to pass you back to Amanda now. Thanks very much. Hi, um, we're just going to play the video there now of the audio from the Travellers Experience. Thanks for that, Amanda. Just... Can't hear it, Tamina. I can't hear any sounds, Tamina. Um, I'll try again. Perfect. Just yeah. See. Yeah. Eileen, how do you know when you're welcome into a place? I think for me, um, I know that I'm welcome, like whatever service it might be, wherever I, I am, if a person treats me with respect and treats me like with dignity and would say, takes the time to, to say hello, good morning or good afternoon, or can I help you with something? Or if you, um, you want to ask a question, then you know that that person is going to be very obliging um, and you don't feel half as um, apprehensive about asking something um, that you're not sure about. That's a very, um, that, that can make you feel very good as well, you know, especially when you're a traveler and you experience so much discrimination. Like when you come away, the feeling that you have would be different from the way you feel when you're after being discriminated against you feel good inside you feel you think to yourself you know what that the that experience was very good and it'll have a positive impact on your day 
you know you'll get through the day and you can kind of like your mood is different you're you know like you constantly dwell on, on the way you were treated and i think for me that's that's how you know when you feel welcome into a place you feel when you're not welcome if you go into a premises there might be other people there and the person that would be in the premises like that or on the premises or would come over to you straight away to say like you know kind of help you in a negative kind of a way and you you're feeling that they just want you out that they're not comfortable right you there or if you go into a, a premises and you're ignored and uh, in, inside in it like it, it happens like all the time like you can find it i i know that the girl was saying a while ago about cinemas and restaurants you can find it in cinemas restaurants all places like that shops if you go into shops like you know the security guards there are sort of their eyes are on you straight away when you walk in the door or if you go into uh, uh, premises that you, you you might need like to ask a question but you're ignored of that you you have that feeling as soon as you walk into the premise no matter what kind of a premises it is you're walking in there with the thinking in your head you know uh are they going to be looking at me? Are going to, am I going to be put out? Are they going to be following me around whatever premises I'm in? So it's a negative feeling that you bring with you all through your life. And like it's been sort of bedded in, in, in our life now that we don't really see the positive a through the negative because there's so much negative happened to us that it's just bedded so strong in our life now. Nor when was the first time you had a negative experience? First time I felt a negative experience was when I started primary school. We had separate playtime to the settled children, and this made me feel very bad. I didn't know why we had to experience this. Following from that, then I had a other negative experience when I was in the queue to use a swimming pool. I could hear the staff saying, We can't leave those children in their dirty, they're from the Halton site. And I felt that you know, it hurt my feelings because I knew I wasn't dirty. I knew I should have had the right to use the swimming pool. But it just stung me and it put me off of ever wanting to use the swimming pool again or going into that service again because I felt very embarrassed that it, that it hurted me. And several other times I had felt ne negative experiences when entering shops or cinemas and stuff like that. And it just stayed with me and it always makes me feel very fearful when I'm entering the premises premises to this day. Jean, nowadays, how often do you feel like this? Well, I felt like that from um, from very young, even access to services with my mother and uh, stuff like that. I always found that uh, that she was never really treated with respect inside them. She was always, um, I think when they found out the part that she, uh, when they give her the paperwork that she wasn't able to fill it out, I found that she was ignored a lot and that um, they could have been more helpful. Now, the paperwork is very hard for anyone, but I just found that they kind of ignored or known that she wasn't going to do this paperwork. She couldn't do the paperwork and she was going to leave the service. And it was a crying out shame because she wouldn't have went to the service in the first place and it took a lot of guts to get her there. And she often lived with very, very negative thoughts. My experience was from that growing up. And now when I, when I see I'm being too friendly, I'm thinking, well, why are they being too friendly? Is it a negative thing or they're watching me? Or, do you know, you can't kind of, um, you can't take the positive no more, even when people is being kind and nice to you. It's my experience from the past I keep thinking, well, they're watching me now and they're not being nice to me there. They're only watching, it'd be nice now to see, for to kind of see what I'm doing and what I'm up to. You know, it's always, it's a shame because some people can, you know, I'm being nice now and things can change and, and um, you still have them thoughts up in your head that they're only being nice to you because they're using for to watch you and see what your mood, your, what you're doing and everything like that. Now, when I go in even to services now, you know when you're welcome because the first thing the person will say, oh, hello, good morning, how are you? Well, you know that person is giving you a bit of um, self-confidence to ask if you need help, you know? But when you go, we'll go up in the queue and you say, if, if you kind of hear them saying, yes, yes, what is it? You will get a person talking very negative like that. Will you will that on then that you met them, that you had, that you left something out in the car or something, just to go back out to the car and, um, not go back in for the for the 
the purpose of you being there. And I think that's a kind of old shame, like the year 2022, like that that's still going on, you know. But I find that that's my part of it anyway. It came from trying to up. It came from me watching my mother with bad experiences. And even today, I get bad experience. And when I get a good experience at a counter, I still get shocked. If to say, like, are they really going to help me here? Like, are they just being nice because there's someone watching them over that's over them you know and i think that's very bad like how you have to keep have that in your conscience the whole time but that would be me anyway my story eileen are you the only person in your family that has gone through this no most certainly not all my family has experienced um this um um discrimination on a daily basis and um, they would all talk about um, how they were treated and the way they felt. And it never, it, it, you never forget, you never forget the negative experience of being treated like that. Yeah. And it's very traumatic as well, because um, like some, some of the things that the women were saying here this morning, like you're almost expecting to be treated that way when you walk into the service, you know? because you're so used to being treated like that. Um, it's very hard to take the positives um, because of so much of the negative experiences that you've had throughout your life, do you know? Uh, um, because you're a traveler, you automatically have to face discrimination on a daily basis. So no, all my family would experience this and they would talk about it, you know? And even if they want to go, go, go out at the weekends or have, um, you know, like uh, go for like nice meal or something like that. If they book some place or whatever it might be, that all of a sudden they're overbooked. They have some excuse. You know, they come home and they 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 say that they were sorry that they even bothered going out. You know, and how bad it makes them feel. And it hurts me then when you see that happening to even one of your own family. You know, so it just never leaves you. It's always there. Margaret. How does it make a difference in your daily life, both in a practical way and emotionally? So in a practical way, I would avoid using public services as much as possible. And when I do have to use them, it's like I have to plan it before. And it's like I have a defense on me going in. And when it's negative, then like I would carry, I would get very angry and I would carry that anger home to my home, to my family. And that would infect my emotional side of it then because I'm always battling like that. Yes, I do deserve these services and just like everybody else and I am worth it. And it's like a vicious circle all the time. So you get out of it and you get back into believing yourself and it's like vicious circle repeating itself all the time. So mostly I would try to avoid services. Thanks, Samina. Um, can I introduce Sharon now to give a brief intro um, and presentation, please? Hi, thanks very much, Amanda. Um, it's really difficult to, to go next to the PowerPoint presentation after listening to that audio. And um, as a non-traveller, I could sit here and pretend that I'm shocked, but I'm not. I suppose I've seen it. I hear it when I am in services and I see travelers trying to access services. So um, I think that this is a really important and really um, timely project because um, everybody does deserve to be able to access services in the same way. So um, as we said at the start, the, the piece of research was carried out by Gabrielle and unfortunately she couldn't be here today. So I'm presenting her research and I'm going to try my best uh, to do that. Um, so I'm just going to bring up the slides there. Okay. 
Now, so I, I suppose I won't go through all the detail again because um, give and Jordan for, gave a pretty good overview of, of what the project involved. And um, I suppose my part in it was doing trauma awareness training. And I think that that audio, as I was listening to the audio, it was a really good, I suppose, justification as to why we need to talk about uh, trauma of discrimination and trauma of racism. I was listening as the women were speaking and talking about, you know, very early childhood experiences of feeling not good enough, being segregated at playtime, um, being othered during what should be normal childhood activities like going to the swimming pool um, and then living that your whole life and it being so consistent, uh, happening so much that you have to create a defense mechanism for yourself in order to keep yourself safe. So doing things like avoiding the services where at all possible or else preparing yourself for being rejected by a service and putting on the defense mechanism that's involved in that. And I suppose for non-travelers, you can say things like, you know, they're not using the service or they're not coming in. Well, then it means that we're not listening because people are very clearly saying why it is difficult to access services. Um, so this project is really important in terms of, of understanding that. Um, so what Gabriella did was she administered a survey at three different points. So there was a pre-training survey administered in September 2020, uh, a post-training survey, survey in November 2021, and then another one six months after that again. So, and then she, she also did some semi-structured interviews post-training as well. So in terms of what was in the structure, so the kind of things that she was looking at um, were um, endorsement of stereotypes. So things like, do people agree with the following statement? Travelers are problematic as clients and service users. Um, she also looked at awareness of bias. So in the for example, in the past, I have treated travelers differently than other people. Um, people's concern about their own bias. I am concerned about the effects of discrimination on travelers. Bias reducing habits. In the past six months, I have tried to put myself in travelers' shoes to see how an issue might affect them. So not to kill you with graphs, but just to give you an example of uh, how things uh, changed over time. So if you look there at cluster one in the first graph, um, this is endorsement of stereotypes. So blaming um, travelers for not using your service rather than looking at whether your service is the problem or whether travelers experiences of other services is making it difficult to access your service. Sharon, so you Sharon sorry for interrupting you. It's just um, I think your, your presentation is not moving through what you're talking about. So I don't see the graph, for example. OK, my internet must be slow, so it catch up. My, my computer isn't as fast as me, if you left the problem, and it eventually <laughs> catch up. <laughs> and I know I, I, my internet might be sometimes just drops for a second, so it should catch up in a minute. Will you give me a thumbs up there when the graphs are up? Perfect, yeah. Because I can see it online. So I suppose I can talk about it. So so in terms of, of endorsement of stereotypes, so, you know, um, I was thinking that travelers are, are the problem and that's why they're not using stereotypes. So um, what we found or what Gabrielle found was, you know, there was a level of that before training. This this um, decreased after training, but six months later, it had started to creep back up again. And the same thing happened across all of the, the different measures. So um, awareness of bias, bias reducing habits and concern about bias. So. So these attitudes and beliefs that people had before the training, they were improved by the training. But then six months later, people had started to slip back into where they had been before. Um, in terms of what came up in the interviews, then um, there was professional versus personal bias. So the, the trainings had helped people confront their professional bias um, the trauma-informed um, TCAT trainings um, were good in terms of personal learnings, confronting, you know, your own personal bias and your own personal experiences. 
Um, and participants felt like the trainings helped them acknowledge um, the strengths of the traveler community and highlight pr uh, protective factors um, from listening to the, the TCAT or the traveler cultural awareness training. Um, I suppose and mentioned this earlier, the five step, the, the, the trauma awareness and the traveler cultural awareness training kind of made sense together. Uh, uh, they, they seemed like a good pair, whereas the um, the five step it was unclear sometimes where that weaved in with that um, and Anne has already spoken about that about uh, making that clearer so in terms of what the, the research concluded is that it's not enough and I suppose we know this from training anyway we know from research that for example if you do if you go and you do CPR training that a lot of what you learn on the day is gone six months later um, so, you know, there's a lot of talk sometimes, you know, at times within organizations about wanting to be more inclusive and doing uh, anti-bias training, etc. Um, and I suppose this research uh, by Gabrielle showed that, you know, it does work, um, but then things start to slip after six months. So it needs to be something that's an ongoing part of an organization embedded within an organization not just a box ticking exercise it needs to be be a live thing a moving thing within an organization just like health and safety is your health and safety within organizations are something that you're constantly looking at and, and constantly refreshing on training um gabriella recommended additional research and evaluation into the delivery of anti-bias training um, organizations to include a discussion amongst their own trainees on traveler cultural competency, ongoing support for community healthcare workers to examine their levels of personal and professional bias towards travelers, providing links between traveler services and community services. And I suppose I, I think this one is the biggest one for me in terms of recommendations is, is increasing diversity within service provision. Um, you know, I suppose I can speak for my own profession. I'm a psychologist. Um, we know that mental health levels are, are, are very difficult within the, the travel community because of the discrimination that they experience. And they find it very difficult sometimes to attend the services. And if we, as psychologists, made sure that we were mentoring and sponsoring travelers so that they go on to become psychologists, um, and have more diversity within professions, then services would actually be for everybody. At the moment, there's not enough diversity within a lot of services. And um, so when you come in, and, and I remember talking to a, um, a woman who's a, who's a beautiful traveler woman who works at Traveler Children, and she said to me that she was really surprised um, when she's working with a, ch a child from the community and then she brings them to a psychologist's office and how they behave at home and how they behave in the psychologist's office is very different. And she said, it's because they're frightened. You're going into an office and you're meeting somebody who's not from the same community as you and you don't know how they're going to treat you. And then a psychologist has a perception of that child on that day. Um, and the way, the biggest way we can address that is actually when children come into services that they meet people from their own community because they've been supported to be, able, to be able to work in whatever job that they want. So um, thanks very much. And I want to say thanks to Gabriella. It's a shame that she wasn't able to be here today to, to present her own slides. Um, so I'll hand it back over to um, Amanda. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'm going to pass you back over to Tamina, if she could play the recording um, with Pauline Stewart, please. Thank you, Amanda. Amanda, could you just tell us a little bit about um, uh, Pauline's stories? Or shall I give a little intro to her? Um, yeah, I was going to tell um, a little about her afterwards, Mila. Okay, sorry, Amanda. So, Go hi, um, okay. Amanda and Pauline. Uh, my name is Breed O'Donoghue, and I'm the Director for Advocacy with the Traveller Visibility Group here in Cork City. Hi, Pauline um, and Breda. My name is Amanda O'Donnell. Um, I'm the drug and alcohol worker in the TVG. Um, I suppose my job entails to um, help support travellers with addiction 
and to help them feel more comfortable um, and start using services and clinics. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak on this uh, recording. My name is Dr. Pauline Stewart, and I'm the executive officer and founder of Family Drug Support, which is an organization in New Zealand. So I'm speaking to you from New Zealand. Tell us a bit about your organization. And I know you touched on it briefly as well, but if you could just give us a little more. Yes, yeah. well, we're nationwide. Um, we're not for profit funded by small donations and grants. Uh, we have 40 volunteers and one, one full time equivalent uh, administrator. Um, we're based in Christchurch in the South Island of New Zealand, and 95% of our work is provided on telehealth to increase the accessibility and be able to include people um, around the whole country. So I'll tell you a wee bit about more about that. Our services include a support line uh, with trained volunteers and that's available from nine o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night and people take shifts, uh, trained volunteers to be on that to listen to family members when they want to ring. Uh, we have a Zoom support group um, once a week where people can come on and be part of that group, although that's a very small part of our service. We have a very comprehensive website with over and over 50% of the people who visit that website are from outside New Zealand. And I do notice on Google Analytics that there are people from Ireland visit that website too, uh, which is Family Drug Support New Zealand. But our flagship program is the five step counselling program, which is available to anybody throughout New Zealand, whether they live in rural town or city and available by a Zoom, by telehealth and using accredited practitioners. Okay, so it sounds like a, quite a lot. Um, sounds very interesting. Um, so Pauline, what do you see as the barriers for Maori accessing drug and alcohol service? What we see, the barriers are exactly the same for Maori as they are for anybody who is an affected family member. Um, the, the barriers are huge, um, accessibility, getting to services, actually um, trying to get to services within a nine to five office hours, um, concealed stigma, the cost of services, if there's any cost, a, a huge lack of understanding of Māori culture um, can be a problem. The need for service to be delivered in a way that people understand what the issues are for the affected family member who is Māori um, and lack of understanding of how to help affected family members, which is quite different from um, a, a helping the focal person. And you, you, you mentioned the level of stigma that Māori feel, I suppose, um, when, when they use specific or these types of services, you know, and it's very similar for travellers, what we've been told and the travellers feel this as well and they, 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 it's been their experience it is their experience that they feel that, they, that, that there is a lot of stigma around it can you tell me as as, as a ceo as the manager uh, how, how do you tackle this um <clears throat> well first of all right from the name um our name is family drug support aotearoa new zealand so people who are of maori descent actually feel included because the the, the maori name of um, New Zealand is included in the title. We have a board member who's a kamatua, so um, that's um, an elder who is an advisory person, so that's very important. We're very, very careful about the people that we select to be five step to do the five step counselling training. Um, all are interviewed, and um, that's quite a process. So we make sure that people are culturally competent before they become before they do the training. Um, whether they're working with Māori or Pākehā or Europeans, it doesn't matter. They have to be culturally competent. Uh, we, at the opening and closing of all training, we do a karakia, which is um, not very normal in New Zealand, where you open um, in Māori and you finish in Māori. The five-step training is very focused on cultural attitudes and competency. That's the two-day training that we do, and there's a lot of counselling practice in that as well. Um, during the accreditation process, which is uh, after the training, we make sure that um, people have the chance to work with Māori uh, affected family members. Uh, all the, all, while people are doing the accreditation for the five-step programme, we make sure that they have to actually record everything for five or six hours 
and that's all um, assessed by an accredited assessor. Uh, we use Māori uh, resources from Māori academics because our, our um, whole organisation is very evidence-based, so we make sure this particular uh, resources, which, <clears throat> which are really important to us, one of them is called Te Whare Tapa Whā, which is about all the aspects of healing. Um, we, the funders in New Zealand absolutely expect that there'll be con uh, competent, cultural competency is addressed and you have to report on that. And uh, health boards, um, we don't get any funding yet from health boards, but in New Zealand we're just setting up a separate Māori health uh, board as well as a, as a, um, a one for everybody. So um, we try to address it in a number of ways. I suppose, how do you work with communities right across the country and facilitate that, that, that bringing people together and getting, uh, mm. I suppose, getting to the target group, you know? I think one of the things is it's really difficult to go on and do anti-bias training and expect that people are going to make any changes. I think that's the, the, the biggest lesson. Um, for, from, for New Zealand anyway, you actually have to embed um, <clears throat> cultural competency right through the service. You can't just do it as a training. Um, I mean, that's fine to do a little bit of training, but that's not going to alter attitudes. So what we make sure we do is that the material, that, that family members, uh, Māori family members, um, get the sense that the people who are working with them actually understand their needs. Got to have practitioners, people working with Māori um, who actually want to do that, that they've got a really good cultural understanding, that they are empathetic. Um, and that comes across what the research says that uh, people understand whether somebody's empathetic right from the moment they come on Zoom or personal. So I think you can't fool people with that. You've got to have a really genuine service. But is this normal or widespread in how services provide training in New Zealand? Um, this is very widespread, this is expected, this is, um, every service is expected to have uh, cultural competency, um, it would be monitored um, in any funding, um, so it's, yes, it is definitely expected. Is it, is it, is it law in the state or, or nationally that, that makes sure that the organisation includes Māori um, like this? Is it because it's law or you feel that there's a, a, an acceptance nationally? About this. There's definitely an, an acceptance nationally that this is what's expected in Aotearoa New Zealand, that all will be included. Um, it's, it's not just, ex th there are laws, um, our, our country is based on the Treaty of Waitangi, which, which was signed in 1840, and so that's kind of an underpinning, but it's not about the laws and it's not about training. It's actually about having people who are working in a service who actually understand what bias is. They actually understand what comp cultural competency is. And I think that's what's expected in New Zealand, that people will have that underpinning in their work um, and work with a wide range of people in a way that's appropriate to the person. I think one of the big things is... Um, People don't want to step over the um, over the threshold of a service unless they feel that they're going to get a really good deal, and that's one of the reasons why I think doing um, the program mainly on telehealth, not just because of the pandemic, um, but also this is a way that if you live out in the country, you can just get onto your phone or get onto your uh, onto your computer and actually do the service, at, do the program. So I think you've got to be accessible, you've got to be, meet people where they are and you've got to meet them with a program that meets their needs. Did you find that the cultural awareness work that, that the non-Maori staff has been doing, has it really made a difference uh, on how they engage with Maori families um, and is doing cultural awareness training something the staff in the projects and government funded projects have to do not all with the five step, but for example, with other services as well. Uh, people are expected and people 
um, are expected to be culturally competent in New Zealand, um, right from when they're selected for positions, uh, right through to their practice. Um, there's various levels of cu cultural competency. It's a really difficult thing to teach, but you do need to have that understanding of different cultures. Um, it, it comes down often to the person themselves, uh, whether they're able to accept the training. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think probably there's an expectation that people will be culturally competent in their work, yes. Do you feel that comparing with travellers, training can happen here that looks like it increases awareness of racism, but travellers experience in it that gets lost, does that, if that makes mm -hmm. sense? Mm. I, th I think the thing is, it doesn't matter which, I'm only talking about New Zealand, I'm not um, mm. offering suggestions to any other country, but I do think, um, including in New Zealand, there is a disparity in um, outcomes for Māori, um, and that uh, we just look at health statistics, we look at a lot of other things, and there's that disparity. What we know is that that has to be addressed, and whatever way that's addressed, that's, that's um, a good way to address it. So you have to do something to try and reduce the disparity. And through okay. small things like um, the work that we're doing, um, and through large governments, government programs, there's a lot of work that yeah, but look you're very welcome and thank you so much and um, for coming on to us today and talking to us about well, how what's happening for maori people in your country and um, we see a lot of similarities and mm. we think it's great that we have this information to compare to what, what's happening for ourselves here in, in ireland so again thank, from you. All of us, thank you very thank much, you very much. yeah thank, thank you very much you. for the opportunity thank you thank you thank you Thanks, Samina. Um, I just want to say thank you again to Pauline Stort, who just joined us there as well. Hello, um, Pauline. Um, we had a 13 hour time difference uh, for the interview. So it was a late evening for us and an early start for Pauline. Um, so again, Pauline, thank you. Um, we thank her for her time and insight into how her non Maori organization has developed culturally strong work and how they monitor Māori engagement to make sure they're meeting the community's needs. Um, let me welcome the panel chair and panelists. Dr. Sharon Labert works with the UCC Applied Psychology Department. Sharon does research with community partners in areas such as addiction, homelessness, criminal justice and education. Her research looks at both adverse childhood trauma and community experience and secondary traumatic stress Panelists today are Brida O'Donoghue and Kate Gibney. Um, again, I just want to let you know that John Paul Collins sends his apology um, as there was a death um, in the Paddy Point today. He couldn't make it. Um, so Brida Dunhu is the manager of advocacy here at the TVG. Brida was involved in setting up TVG and she is a traveler culture awareness trainer. Um, Kay Gibney has worked in drug and alcohol services in a variety of jobs for the past 18 years. Kate has been coordinator of the original drugs task force for a number of years. Um, you could take it away, Sharon. And, uh, so I will, um, I'm going to hand over to the, the panelists now in a minute, but if people want to put some questions into the chat or some suggestions, or some takeaway points that you have from today and um, that you'd like, maybe like to, to, to hear more from the panelists. So I suppose um, Kate and, and Brida, um, I suppose I'm gonna hand over to you and I'm gonna ask you the, the following question. What can we do now? You know, what, are, what, what is our next step in terms of, of moving this forward so that everybody can access services equally? You want me to come in there, Sharon? Yes, please, Kate. Yeah, um, I suppose I, I found the research really, really interesting and there was lots of takeaways for me. I know you were asking people to throw it in there as questions and it was really interesting that the, the cultural awareness training kind of had a shelf life of six months by the sounds of it. Um, so it's maybe something that we can look at in our services in terms of 
first ensuring that everyone has training completed, because I know it's not something we would have previously looked for when we were hiring people, but maybe it's something that we could do moving forward. Um, like it was obviously always, a, it, it would be obviously a bonus if people had specific trainings done and had experience of, but it might be something moving forward that, that we have a requirement around that would ensure that staff make sure that this is as important as other pieces of training in drug and alcohol services. Um, so what other bits? Like I like that idea of, of what you were saying in terms of it needs to be live and it needs to be moving and it needs to adjust to what people are telling us. So again, it's us as services mm -hmm. getting that information from people in terms of what helps you to get in the door. And I know Anne touched on it and I know that the research touched on it as well. So what can we do? And as well, similar to yourself, Sharon, it was devastating to hear people's experiences of when they're trying to access services, when they're in a shop, if they're being nice, does it mean this? If they're not being nice, I suppose the effect of that must be absolutely harrowing. <clears throat> but I suppose we can look at, and I think it's, it's particularly difficult in drug and alcohol services because nearly all the people that try and access our services are filled with guilt and shame and are at a very, very low vulnerable place coming in. And obviously that includes travellers, but there's probably more to try and negotiate and navigate to try and get in our front doors than maybe other other types of people coming in. So it's again us being mindful of that and hearing very clearly what will help you as a traveller to pick up the phone, what will help you to come in our door, can we come in, do we need to come into your halting site, like what would help you in terms of accessing what we have to offer. And then when we do sit with you and, and Amanda and Anne can speak more around this as well. Like, what are we offering? Is that what you need? Do we need to look at the programs that we're providing? Um, are they going to meet what you need as a traveler coming into our services? Like there's there's a wealth of stuff that we need to look at. Like it's it's a very simple question, but a very complex in terms of trying to speak to it. <laughs> but I suppose, first of all, it's, it's hearing what are people's experiences? Like I know from talking to, like I spoke to the manager of Cool Mine who, oversees all our community projects. And he was saying, Kate, we've little or no one, no travelers accessing the services. And that's really sad. Um, mm -hmm. And why is that? And again, Anne and Amanda can speak to their experiences mm -hmm. um, within, a, within a traveler service of people trying to access services. Yeah. Something yeah. needs to be done. So it needs to start with us as a service looking at what are we doing? Are we unknowingly, is there blocks? Is there obstacles that, that are there that shouldn't be there? Um, and how do we remove them? Um, and I, I've no doubt, like we're very open to all of that. Um, like if we can do better, let's do it. Because a lot of it might be down to very basic lack of awareness. It might be down to training. It might be, there might be very simple steps. So they're kind of tangible things that we could absolutely do. And I love the idea as well of, of, of travelers accessing a service and being met by professional travelers. And again, that's not something that I've ever experience like I've interviewed lots of people in lots of different posts and again maybe I wasn't aware of it but I was never aware of of interviewing a traveler for a post um, and I know for me personally that would be something I would be very excited about um, because if people can be met by a member of their own community it doesn't get better than that and it's the same with all our other services be it Polish or, 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 or whatever women's groups, it, it's nice for people to be met with a similar experience that understand what the blocks are and can, I suppose, help us to, to move those out of the way. Um, but I, I, I suppose just to finish up, what I like the most is that from the lady from the last service thing is there's an expectation for people to be culturally competent. I don't think we have that. So that's something that I know I can tangibly ensure that that happens in terms of our drug task force, in terms of when we're interviewing, that there's an onus, and when we're putting job descriptions together, there's an onus for people to be culturally competent and that we can try and deliver that in services. So that was a little bit of what I took from it. Thanks. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. Can I just, um, sorry, um, can I just, I suppose just, I'd like to echo um, everything that Kate said as well, you know, with regards to what we can do uh, to improve, I suppose, um, how services look at um, 
the traveler community or maybe how the travelers view the services, you know, and there's a multitude of different reasons behind why travelers are not accessing the services. And um, as a cultural awareness trainer myself, um, I my experience has been every time I've ever delivered a training session, I people come up to me afterwards and say, Jesus, I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know, I didn't know that. You know, that kind of um, a light bulb thing goes off in your head and you say, Jesus, have I been like that? You know, have I been, have I been racist or have I ha been, ha do, do you know, do, the anti-bias piece, like have I been biased without even realizing that I have been? And a lot of that comes with um, not knowing, you know, um, but I suppose for, for, for travelers, look, I suppose if we look at the big picture, our stats are very poor with regards to health and mental health. And we know that travelers are not used as, using the services the way they should or could be. And for me, it's about the services looking at that and saying, um, this is not good enough, you know? And as I, I've said a number of times in any of the, the, the cultural awareness sessions that I've delivered, anybody and everybody that comes in contact with a traveler, uh, frontline staff, it's not good enough that they know absolutely nothing about travelers. Not in 2022, it's not good enough, you know? And if they do know something about travelers, it has to have come from a more reliable source than through the media, you know? So people need to, to wake up and I suppose smell the roses, you know? There, there, is, there is a major blockage within the system that's prohibiting travelers from using the services and we need to ask ourselves why. You know, and we can say, like I said, it's a multitude of reasons. People are fearful. They're worried how they'll be treated. It could be stigma. They may not be at that stage yet. That they feel they need to use the service. And um, culturally, travelers would use, would um, would come to older travelers to 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 look for support uh, 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 and advice with regards to um, uh, issues like that within the community. But um, but I suppose true to different circumstances that I won't go into now, travelers don't have the same support network that they did long ago. And so we have to, we're becoming more reliable on the services and, and they're not working and we need to really pin it down uh, and, and put an effort into making sure, not just about doing a traveler cultural awareness session because it's more than that. It's a complete and utter ignorance of what it's like for somebody that has lived on the margins of society their whole life and faced those levels of discrimination and racism every single day. And as was mentioned earlier in some of the, the audio clips from the traveler community healthcare workers, it's not just them, it's the whole entire family that are facing these issues. So I suppose for the services to look at what they can do, I suppose to begin with, they, re they really need to assess how they've worked for travelers and how and what they need to do going forward. And that can only be done by linking in as closely as possible to the traveler organizations, the traveler community healthcare workers, uh, and, and getting that, that uh, I suppose, creating those links that that message can then be brought back out to the community. This is a service you can trust. This is a service that does want to help and support you. This is a service that doesn't care if you're a traveler or doesn't care where you come from. You know, that's the type of message we need to be. Travel organizations need to be able to tell our community when we're talking or, 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 or I suppose signposting them to a particular service. Thanks, Brida. I think one of the important things, I suppose, picking up from what you said and what Kate said was that um, I suppose I'm, I've been friends with people in TVG for a good few years now. And, um, you know, TVG has been working very hard to build partnerships with other community organizations to increase the availability to the traveling community. But it's not actually the traveling community's responsibility to be changed in public services. So if you, if you run a public service and there is a part of the public that's not accessing your service, that's your job to say, what are we not doing? Rather than the traveling community constantly having to knock on doors to be heard. Um, so it's about putting responsibility back on the organizations who are supposed to be um, public services. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of the questions and the comments here, and then I'm going to go back to Kate and, and Brida. 
So um, Padraig Lohan from Tipperary Rural Traveller Project, is there sufficient access to anti-bias and trauma-informed practice training nationwide for all organisations to avail of it? And if not, what is the next step to meeting that demand? I suppose I, I, I think that, um, or I think it kind of speaks to my last point, Padraig, is that there's this expectation that um, travellers have to come and fix services. So sir, there's, there's plenty of um, different local traveller organisations around the country that organisations can link in with um, who can provide them with the service that they want. Um, but it seems to me that one, the community has to do all the hard work. Um, and Marie Quilligan, Tipperary Rural Traveller Project, um, great presentation. It's not a question, but an observation. I have often been very alarmed by the high number of traveller children that I work with prescribed medication for ADHD. Like Sharon was saying, the children would be completely different from working with me and our team. And the last thing I would have expected was a medical solution as opposed to supporting the children to learn grounding techniques and how to regulate themselves to feel safe. I'm not a medical professional or anti-medication, but the disproportionate levels are concerning. And I sometimes think it is because the professional is led by unconscious bias at times. Um, yeah, that is a very fair uh, comment, Anne-Marie. Um, and I think that what the, you know, if you go back and you listen, when we, when we heard from the women talking about their experiences and it starts in childhood, and if you arrive to the door of the service and all of your experiences have been negative and you're frightened and you're stressed and you're worried and you're afraid that you're going to be treated really badly, then that's going to activate your fight or flight response. So you're going to come into the service and you're going to be emotionally dysregulated and people are going to think you're a problem rather than understanding this is a child who experiences discrimination everywhere they go. So what they're doing is protecting themselves from being emotionally hurt by activating their fight or flight response system. And if we were aware of the trauma of discrimination, and if we were really aware of listening to the voices of travelers, um, then those children, when they come in, um, we would be able to recognize that the way that they are here is, is actually a lot to do with, I suppose, what we've done. So Robbie Sludds is a Traveller Inclusion project, project worker based in Wexford. Is it possible as, ser is it possible as services trying to engage with the community? Why don't the services start going to where they are at in the community? The travellers are more comfortable in their own environment. The community needs to see the faces instead of the acronym. This builds relationships and trust at their, at their level. Now, so um, I'm going to hand back over to you, Breathe, there for a minute to pick up on a couple of those comments and questions when I'm reading through the next ones, if that's okay. Any kind of thoughts or comments about some of the issues that were raised there, Brida? Hi, Sharon. I'm just trying to look at the message there now. Or the, 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 um, just trying to find out what the actual question is. Very interesting. There was some interesting, I'm sorry, I'm going to put in, there was some interesting one there, I suppose it was just Aoife commenting on cultural competency being part of service level agreements um, or service plans, you know, and um, which goes back to really what Kate was saying, what Frida is saying, and it's a very practical piece. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and we, like, it's in the audio there with Pauline, we, we talked about cultural competency, you know, um, it's a given, it should be a given right across the board. And uh, like Sharon said, we shouldn't have to be pleading for this and, 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 and campaigning for, for, for services to have cultural competency. It, it, it should come with the, as part of the job, you know, for everybody um, and, and travellers included in that as well. Um, and I suppose, again, I suppose just to touch on, on one of the, the, the things that came up there around travellers, having, uh, having travellers in these types of roles, which is great. And I would advocate for that all of the time. But I suppose it, it, there's a there's a fine line as well that it that there's not an expectation that just because this person or this worker is a traveler that she can fix everything that's going on, you know, because that that's not the case either. Um, but I suppose just to to to, to look at the the question around um the, the from I think it's from Kira, I'm not sure. Um, cultural humility should be incorporated more into cultural concepts. Yeah, training programs with staff. 
Yeah, I suppose again, what Kira's mentioned here about institutional racism and organizational racism, you know, systemic stuff that's been going on long before our time, you know, that's some of the stuff that we that needs to be addressed um, in organizations as well. Uh, and we have been mentioning this for some time now, you know, and I suppose the big thing for us as traveler workers, um, we, we work with the services and as myself, I use as an example, I have been around now for a while. So I have, I have gotten to meet um, different people over the years that are in the same post, but that one moves on and the other, another person comes in. And I have to start right at the very bottom of building a relationship with that person again. And you, you, you go through all the cultural pieces and you talk about the systemic racism and, and then that person moves on, you know, and, and the next, the new person, the newbie comes in again and, and, and it's the very same thing. You're going back to, to, to day one or square one, you know, whereas if if cultural competency was incorporated in right across the board, that's the employer's job. They should be doing that. I shouldn't have to start fresh with talking about culture again and racism and discrimination with the, with the, with the new person that comes into the role, you know, and, and, and that has been happening for the last 25, 30 years. And it's a bit, um, it's a bit soul destroying in one hand, but it's very deflating as well. Um, and you're, you 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 just feel that you're, you're, you're on this merry, merry go round, and you just can't get off at, at the best of times, you know. Thanks, Brida. Um, I'm just going to read out a couple of comments as well. So, um, from Kath, Catherine Hartford, I think that that's there. Um, hello everyone. Thank you for an excellent webinar this morning. The audio was very powerful. Um, yeah, I think that that was, I, I kind of had a pain in my, I did, I had a pain in my heart uh, listening to it. Um, funding and support for relational based work is so important. And I think, Bridie, you said that at the start as well about the rena relational based. Mm -hmm. And I suppose one of the things that's not new from the research that was done is if you look at any indigenous community anywhere, so we heard about experiences of the Maori community, but if you look at Native Americans, etc. The experiences of the traveling community mirror that of, of other indigenous um, communities. So the research isn't new. And, and that thing about re relational and about, you know, and Breda touched on it there about having to constantly build a new relationship. Like the onus is on, on, on the rest of us, actually. Um, I think that there are too many of us uh, who don't uh, spend enough time with travelers or traveler organizations. And, and don't even recognize the diversity within the community. Um, even, you know, we can all be guilty of, you know, doing our, our traveler cultural awareness training and then think, thinking they're all travelers then are the same. You know, there's, there's, there's diversity within the community as well. Um, uh, cool mine in Dublin saying that they have dealt with stigma and addiction for many years and they'd like to think that um, people and both male and female um, are treated the same irrespective of the community and that they have increased um, the numbers of travelers access in their services. So I'm conscious of the time and we're going to be wrapping up in, in a minute and there, there's comments and questions coming in all over the place from two different sources and I'm trying to keep up with them. So Kate, any kind of parting comments in terms of, you know, I know you, you've mentioned about uh, thinking about, you know, embedding the, the culture piece more. So any more kind of part and comments on, on what you'd like to see, maybe even from other services, um, you know, how, because, you know, it's not just enough for, for addiction services, all services have to work together in a coordinated way for people to have the best outcomes. So any part and comments in terms of that? Uh, no, I think, Sharon, it's just even if we could follow through on the pieces that we thought were helpful and that people are saying had an impact. So it's keeping it really simple because I think it's, well, I, I've no doubt it, like the response to it is very complicated, but even at a very basic level, like Breda was saying, and like Anne was saying, like, do we have that written into our SLAs? So when we're giving people funding, like, is it an automatic that there's an expectation that this is just done? You know, because I was listening to Brida, that must be phenomenally frustrating. It's like Groundhog Day. Every time she encounters a new staff member or another service, it's like it's her responsibility to educate. And it's not. She's right. 
Like we need to do better, absolutely. But I suppose at a very basic level, if we could look at our expectation in terms of when people come to fill posts within our services, that that might include, and that should include at a, a bare minimum, because it is a bare minimum, the cultural awareness training piece. And if we look then at, I suppose, how services, like I know the relationships with traveller projects on the ground are very good and they're very solid and that's a wonderful thing across Cork and Kerry. But I suppose if people aren't presenting the services, and again, I'd be interested in what Amanda and Anne have to say, how can we do better? And it might be very small things that we're just not aware of, but again, it's making those changes. So, and I suppose the biggest thing is that this conversation continues after we finish at half 11 that this isn't just something we did for an hour, hour and a half. And sure, weren't we great lads? Lovely piece of work. Well done. And everyone goes away. So that the pieces that we've highlighted, that there's actually follow through on it and that there's some, I suppose, uh, that it's translated into practice because that's what it's about. Like our door has to be open, has to be accessible. And if there's anything that we can do to make that easier, let's do it. It's not rocket science, I'm assuming, that, yeah. that yeah. the people on here know exactly what works. So let's do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, so it's that 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 thing of of avoiding having a client blameworthy perspective. So if it's the, you know sometimes if we build it, they will come. So if we build a service, people will come, and that doesn't always happen. Um, and then blaming people when they don't turn up. There was a, a, a new primary care project was created in New Zealand a couple of years ago. And it was specifically for the Maori community and they built a brand new building and, and people didn't come, they didn't choose it. Um, the attendance rate was about 30%. Um, so they went out and they spoke to the community and it was really practical barriers, childcare, transport. Um, and then down on top of all that, you had discrimination and the impact of discrimination, the trauma of discrimination on, on some members of the community. And when they worked more closely with the community, and designed the service for their needs, the attendance rate went up to uh, over 70%. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's that thing of, of not just thinking, I've built this service, now people will come. So Brida, any parting comments fr from you in terms of? Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose, yeah, so I suppose for me, um, I would be suggesting or saying to people, look, um, there needs to be an acceptance that this is happening, that this is going on. Um, and I want people to accept that this may or may not be happening within their service um, and then take a stand on that and make sure that they're doing their best to, to, to I suppose, to, to, to include, um, to include the, the, this anti-bias within their, 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 their service. Um, I think things will get better once the acceptance is there, because we have seen a resistance over the years from services or individuals with regards to accepting the very high levels of racism and discrimination the travelers experience. We've also seen the side where people tell us, Jesus, I didn't know that, I didn't realize that was happening. And then they go back to their own job and then like the whole research and report is about people forgetting or just, it, it just evaporating away after six months. And um, this is um, life changing for my community that people accept that this is happening and that we do everything in our power to make sure that we're addressing this issue and, and getting the support right across the board, across all services to make sure that travelers are included um, as much as possible to, to try and, and make some improvements around uh, a better quality of life for, for, for the community. Yeah. Thanks, Brida. I'm just going to finish there on one more comment from Kira Ridge. Um, it's about providing culturally safe care as defined by the patient. So I know you're coming from a mental health perspective there, Kira. Um, as in, so, so a traveller saying what it is is that, that makes it safe for them and their community um, and is measured through progress towards achieving health equity. Um, so we have a long way to go to achieve health equity if we look at the stats. And I know I, I've missed the comment now, but it, it came up earlier on about the, the impact on physical health of discrimination. So the question that was asked was, did this study look at that? No, it didn't. Um, but there is loads and loads of research out there that shows that, that shows the impact of discrimination and exclusion on physical health. 
um, and the outcomes within the community. So I'm going to, to, to wrap up the, the panel discussion and hand back to Amanda to, to, to close off. And, um, and I think going back to just to finish on what Brida said, that it can't just be about, thanks for inviting me today. Aren't you great, lads? That's a lovely report. I'm going to go back to normal. And if travellers don't come to my service, that's sure, feck it. Um, that's actually not good enough. Um, seven the, 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 the travel the suicide rates in the traveling community are seven times higher for, for men and six times higher for women and than they are from from the settled population there are children who don't go to school not because they don't want to they don't go because they're treated badly or they hear you know the overhear comments and actually it's on all of us in every single day it's not just about service provision it's when you're talking to your children when you're having dinner with your family and somebody says a comment that they shouldn't say, and it can feel really awkward in the moment, but it can't be just turning up to a webinar. So if you're sitting around with people and they say something negative about the community, you need to challenge it. Um, and we, that the only way that we're ever going to truly move forward is by challenging systemic and structural racism. So, um, Thanks to, to, to Kate and, and Breda um, for giving their thoughts and I hope that we'll be able to move all of those things forward and I'll hand back to Amanda to close up. Thanks very much. Um, I suppose let me thank all who has been involved in this event, um, to our panel chair and panellist, to Pauline Stort. Let me thank Mella McGee from Cork City Partnership who has done a huge work behind the scenes getting this webinar organised. Most importantly, can I thank my colleagues who shared their experience of discrimination and the impact it made on our traveller lives. Thank you very much. I pass you over to Anne Jordan Burley. Yeah, thanks very much, Amanda. I think that was the, the right finish. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. And can I just say, I, I put in the chat there one thing that Amanda said um, earlier, um, like the onus on us as project workers, I suppose, aside from in management, about coming out and leaving our laptops, coming out from behind them and going to meet with members of the, of the community as well is like some small pieces of work we can be doing. So you know, I thought it was very powerful what she said. Thank you. Thanks, Mala. Thanks, Mala. Okay. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Now. Bye.